You're listening to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. One half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Welcome back to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. I am your host, Seth Partnow, uh, joined as always by our head of football analysis, Matt Edwards, the coach. Matt, how you doing? Good. I, it, it's always for now until I miss a podcast for some reason, and then you're going to have to change the intro. Yeah, yeah. and uh, our our usual guest, CEO and founder Ted Knutson is here as well, back from back from extended theme park uh, extravaganza. So, so this feels unfair to me because I was ready for the week that you guys were on holiday, but then suddenly, like, I'm the guest because we didn't record the week that you were on holiday, and now I'm like one out of sequence. I don't agree with this. This feels unfair. I've been doing a podcast longer than either of you bastards. So there. It's like one podcast and then you're out. This is you're like hey, one <laughs> one or two strikes already. It's it's, it's the eliminator pod. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It, yeah, it's it's the royal rumble of pods. You went over the top rope and you can't get back in. Um, as we like to do, uh, Matt was very uh, adamant that he he did in fact have a Baja blast of the week. The the well ran dry last week when we recorded twice and he didn't have a second Baja blast, which. Um, is unusual because I think that's, you know, an average morning for him is two Baja Blasts. Oh, but, Christ, <laughs> but, but so Matt, what is your Baja Blast of the week? Okay. So I went to the store yesterday. These just came out. They are Baja Fiery Mango Doritos. Whoa. So this is part of the 20th anniversary Baja Blast release. So have you not tried them yet? Them on the pod. No, I saved them specifically for this. We, Kev, we need to switch. So Kev Lawson is our is our producer here. We need to switch to a video pod for moments like this because this is too exciting. This is like you got to like smell, it, give it a sniff, give it a swirl. <laughs> you get some good mango flavor. It claims to be fiery mango. I'm not sure if there's a little Baja flavor in there. Ooh, speaking of fiery mango, um, I had one of the so. If you guys are familiar with Disney World and land, and shout out to Kathy Edwards, who always is a great uh, advisor on uh, Kathy Evans. Uh, Evans, sorry, yes. Evans. See, I've already failed myself here. Kathy Evans, formerly of the Washington Wizards, or are they Bullets? Who knows? Um, anyway, I'm feeling myself all over the place. I'm trying to talk about Dole Whip. Okay, that's all I'm trying to do. Mm. Thank you. I got there yes. eventually. Um, so. Disney has multiple flavors of Dole Whip now. And I took my children to basically all the Dole Whip stands at Disney, of which they now apparently have strawberry. They have orange. They obviously have OG pineapple. And the one I was thinking about was mango. So there's a mango stand that is near Mexico. Um, and you can get a fruit mango Dole Whip with tagine and like a chipotle syrup. And that is fiery mango. So there we are. That's my Baja Blast of the week. There you go. Right. That that is that's a good one. Um, switching from from fiery Baja Blasts to uh, to hot topics. Um, something that's that's come up a lot. I don't know. It's a terrible segue. I'm sorry. No. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not hot topic. The the store that all the now we the, just need rocker t shirts. Yeah. Baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got the Hardy Boys on on now. Um. Uh, we're a mess already. Uh, <laughs> um, an interesting thing that 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 has sort of started to develop in in really the the the, the transfer portal is almost the professionalization, the NFLization of college roster management. Professionalization in, is the opposite of this podcast this time. Yeah, right? it's very much so, very much so. But the, the college teams now need personnel departments. Because not only do they have to recruit players, they have to retain players every year, multiple times a year. The something that's been really interesting is the number of players who entered the portal in the first window, transferred, didn't like what they what was going on in spring ball, or maybe someone threw a bigger bag at them, I don't know, and are in the portal again now. So first of all, I think this is a this is a development that that really matches a, across a lot of sports. I think most professional sports started like the coach was everything. And then as they became more complex, you, these sort of front offices kind of grew and expanded. And that, that led to both some cleaner decision, but also um, questions of organizational alignment. And so I wanted to talk about that both in relation to college and how it compares to the NFL. And if some of those things, the, some of the, the, the bifurcation of on and off field responsibilities 
starts to become a thing in, in college, which has very much been uh, a coach driven uh, situation. So Matt, I guess I want to start with you uh, in terms of what was the, the changes you saw in your time in college football from when you started to kind of when you left to, to come here about the importance of whether it's a, a GM, a director of football, director of player personnel, what have you, that kind of role. Yeah, when I first became a graduate assistant after I finished playing, the recruiting coordinator was a one of the full-time coaches, you know, and so he was in charge of the recruiting. And this was on top of his duties of coaching a uh, position and doing his own recruiting, but being in charge of making sure that the recruiting plan was set and people were visiting the right um, recruits. And so that was, you know, maybe just over 10 years ago. And now you see, I, I'm shocked by all of these titles that people are getting, like general manager, assistant general manager, assistant to the general manager. Um, but I think that the staffs really have just exploded. Um, you go from one person who is also doing a whole bunch of other things to, you know, 10 to 15 people who are fully dedicated to this recruiting thing. You know, it started with on-campus recruiting, you know, you would get a director of high school recruiting potentially uh, and, you know, kind of expanding the departments that way. And, you know, that made sense. These teams are making money hands over fist and could not pay the athletes for a while. And so they had to put the money somewhere. So they developed these recruiting departments and it started, like I said, with high school. And now that the transfer portal is exploding, you need a whole other wing or department inside of recruiting just for college players. Yes, yeah, so you need like a portal NIL director as well as kind of the high school director and then someone to coordinate the personnel around it. One of the things that immediately deviates from the NFL model is obviously, you know, the head coach is kind of the independent leader of the ship here, whereas in the NFL, like the general manager is technically the leader of the ship. And you have you know, athletic directors that are trying to hire the best coaches, but then how do you run that? Then there's the next question of how do we run a program that is good for the university of XYZ, as opposed to a program that is good for the coach of XYZ? Uh, and you know what sort of legacy things can we build? And some forward thinking ADs have started to do that. And they, they reach out to multiple areas with an analytics support department that touches on potentially basketball or soccer or obviously football. But then other ones, like it's just, it's the coach's beef and no one is supposed to walk inside of that department without permission. And in fact, sometimes they don't even have keys to get into that department without permission. So it's a, it's quite a different prospect. Then you have the other bit that I found kind of really intriguing when I started to think about like structure and organization, which is something we do in running a business all the time. In the NFL, in the professional space, like the coaches are sort of handed players, right? Like it's what, what falls to you in the draft? And then, you know, which free agents can you get? Uh, in college, the coaches are important in recruiting the players to come play for them. And there's actually a relationship there. And does the player trust the coach in what's going on? Does the coach trust the player to execute and dedicate? And that's very different. It's much more like a business where I would not hire somebody for Seth uh, without having Seth first meet that person, talk to that person, make sure that he agrees that we're fitting there or not. We might occasionally have a disagreement. We never have, but you might occasionally have that. But in the NFL, it's just a very different set of prospects and you have dramatically different things you have to do in the recruitment of personnel to play for a college team versus the professional space. That relationship bit has always been interesting to me just because of how transient the the coaching population is like both at the, the head coach level but certainly at the position coach level um it's like i really vibe with this offensive line coach and he's now the he's now the oc at, at a at a at a smaller school okay what happened or you have the arizona problem right yeah. where arizona's head coach goes somewhere else that has a much bigger budget and what happens to the players on that team and you know can he cherry pick the best or not in the transfer portal era before that was not really a concern and now you're like hmm, all right what are we supposed to do with that because you kind of expect them to take some or many of their coaching staff with them you never before expected them to take the players so let me let me analogize this because i think that this is 
I would say a decade behind where where kind of world soccer is from moving from the manager to the to the coach director of football, which hasn't permeated everywhere completely. But... It's less, right? So this is a really good question that actually is relevant right now. Um, so Michael Edwards uh, was hanging out at Sloan Sports Analytics Conference uh, along with Ian Graham, who was on the panel. Uh, Michael and Ian sort of were working together in, in Ludonautics, which is a, a consultancy uh, with some of the, the best minds in, in, the, in the industry uh, for, you know, doing different jobs for soccer teams. And it, you know, it, the difference in the volume of world soccer teams that are professional versus the volume of, of American football teams that are professional is, is pretty dramatic. Like even if you lumped college into that and said all of college was good enough, you're still only looking at eight professional soccer leagues worth of it versus we collect you know, 120 competitions, uh, the, but the money's different and there's a lot more money in the American football on a per, per team basis, but it's still something I find intriguing. Anyway, Michael Edwards just recently went back to Fenway sports group and, and basically overseeing Liverpool's football operations side. Um, so he's effectively taken on what we would call kind of originally the Billy Bean role, uh, or the Theo Epstein role or, or whatever. But he's doing it across multiple teams because they've now said that they're going to go multi-club. And so he doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day. -day. That's really one of the first times that that's happened in world soccer um, versus it feels like American, like the bigger American sports professionalized this many, many years ago. The college space is the one that seems like it's still, you know, two to three to five years behind. And part of that is like the cult of personality, but also part of it is like who's qualified, who even writes the fucking job description? Because in, in the soccer space, there are far too few people that are qualified to run a modern football team and everything that needs to happen. And in fact, in the coaching space, there are far too few people who are qualified to do that. When you think about what a coach needs to do, they need to obviously hire their own staff. They need to set the tactics or you know the, the game plan. They need to be able to work with medical. They need to be able to work with like the physios and the fitness people to make sure that those players are there, the weight, the strength and conditioning staff. Then they need to go upstream into the AD. So they need to manage upward. They need to potentially work with the boosters and, and whoever is doing the, the booster program to be able to do that. They get is an impossibly diverse job. <laughs> then they have to face the fucking media. You, you haven't even you haven't even mentioned really the most important part, I think, which is the personal bit of working with players, not just the yeah. tactics, but sort of the instilling like the team ethic and motivation and stuff like that. We and have you, known a lot of genius dudes who, who have fallen flat at that thing, and that's the biggest thing. And Matt and I have talked a couple of times where you watch somebody's press conferences or even their inside team sort of conferences from some sort of thing, and you kind of wince a little bit. You're like, oh, he's just missing. Like, he's just not doing it. He doesn't have it. Yeah, I mean, that happens all the time. And, and I think that you see this with what happened with Chip Kelly this year is he – took a step down from head coach to be offensive coordinator at a similar level, not just like going up a level to move down a, a, a rank on the ladder, but he, his reasoning was just, he missed football. You know, as the head coach, you would, you were involved in so many things. And a lot of that is being kind of siloed away from a coach. Like you mentioned medical, you've got a medical staff, you've got a recruiting staff now uh, with the, collectives in theory they are doing the fundraising and getting the money together to pay the athletes but you know that's a, a huge aspect of coaching for a long time too was fundraising right being nice to boosters and going to get money for whatever the newest thing is the newest shiniest thing for your um, team and so i think the general manager and, and like seth was talking about the NFLization of this kind of organization structure. I don't know how long it's going to be, but five, 10, 15 years, you know, maybe we do see the return of head coaches to being more actual head coaches, like actually doing the football thing. And I, <laughs> knowing a lot of coaches in the business, I bet that they would love that. You know, they may not love the pay cut that it would require because you're going to have to pay other people to do some of the other important things, but to be able to just coach football, like a lot of the coaches, they get into coaching one because, you know, they like to help young people grow and, and whatever, but they could do that in a lot of different ways. They love football. And I think anything that gets them the ability to return to football, they're going to be all about.
That's probably true. They got to wrap their head around taking in different sources of information, which is relevant to this pod, right? Like you need to have a new way of analyzing transfer portal players and of analyzing even high school players potentially. And you need to also have the game manager concept and, and being able to talk to the nerds and the nerds giving you new sets of information too. I don't disagree with you. I think your coaches at the bigger programs are paid so much money that they could take like a small portion of their money and set it aside for new staffers. And if they did a quality of life improvement there, like if they really thought about it, they probably would make that leap, but they probably don't actually know what the potential options are for that quality of life improvement. And so it will take some years to either educate and, um, and transition or to have the new coaching ranks and generations come through that understand this stuff better and, and press it upwards. Just hearing this, the description of all this stuff, I mean, even in the, the professional teams that have the coaching and the front office split, um, it's it's very disruptive. New GM comes in, a big chunk of sort of the, the underlying staff changes, and you just kind of, you, you sort of kick a lot of corporate knowledge in the ass. A with the volume of coaching changes uh, change and the like the amount of unfamiliar positions that sort of need to get uh, assessed and hired and stuff like that that this is not sort of a a university function rather than a coaching function that's something that that to do it well almost has to change but obviously in the current generation of elite coaches obviously there's going to be great resistance to that change of course nobody wants to give up power no one wants to you know delegate to, to parts unknown, right? And then you have all the political problems that you have all the time in every single organization. I have a couple of friends who work in, in soccer teams and they've gone into new ones over the last two years. And they're like, Jesus Christ, this place is even more dysfunctional than the last place, which I kind of didn't think was possible. And we have seen this happen with our friends in other sports. It is the same story. It's just different sports. There's a great article by Alec Lewis in The Athletic, and we're going to talk about it more next week when we really focus on the draft. But it was ostensibly about teams know the right way to draft, but they can't bring themselves to do it because of all the sort of biases and uh, agendas and, and over certainty that sort of plays into to player evaluation. Um, but th it could have easily been about any like top level sports organization in terms of how much of it isn't getting necessarily the smartest best evaluators best analysts best minds in the room it's it's getting everyone rowing in the same direction yeah and i think the the difficulty there i think you touched on a little bit seth is at the end of the day and, and going forward currently it's it's the head coach's ship right and whether that's a coach that is planning on using this as a stepping stool for another job um like potentially a high profile coach in the new big 12 where all his decisions are going to be made about right now. And we want to be good right now. So we're going to recruit 50 new transfers and we're going to do this so that we can make an impact right now. Well, that leaves the school who it is the school's team, right? It's the university of Colorado Buffaloes. Oh, I was trying to figure out who you're talking about. Not the oh, shocker. Not the <laughs> the coach prime Buffaloes, as you know, you may be confused. Is he's the one with the TV show and and the book deal and is yeah. We could talk a lot about that, but that's not for this anyway. So he's making a decision about right now, and that happens in the NFL too. Like you see general managers. I can't remember which one it was, but recently came out and said, "Hey, I I made this controversial pick because if it doesn't work out." I'm fired anyway. And if it does work out, then that's great. I bought myself a couple more years. And that type of thinking is not necessarily productive for long-term success, right? Where everyone's kind of worried about their jobs. Are they going to get fired in a year? And you know, you have some of that with coaching at the football level, but especially as you're making those decisions, even if you're planning on leaving in a year, you're going to be making vastly different choices. And you know, I think like Ted said, like what kind of data are you going to be using? What what kind of decision making help do you have as you're making these decisions that are going to, I mean, change the total trajectory of the school's football team? Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Right? It's, it's the simplest thing in the world, right? And so how do you build an incentive structure in college football, more like the NFL and the NFL, you have to do that too, where long-term thinking and sort of the, the three-year or five-year plan 
is the actual incentive structure. And maybe you can do that in contracts. Like we've seen contracts change over time at the coaching level, at the GM level, where you know, you're kind of getting options on future years. And if those future years pay off, you also get paid quite significantly. Uh, if your baseline is just keeping your job, that's a different thing. But if you're looking at this is my total compensation package over time, and my job is to build the long term productive uh, future here, like that's a different thing. But you've got to be upfront about what your actual incentive package looks like. For Colorado, it was probably going from irrelevance back into some sort of vague relevance. And, you know, there's a lot of Buffalo uh, marketing that's going on in in, in Coach Prime world. <laughs> you know, see you. I, I don't I don't know if that's the the primary bit, but it's still happening. I think the biggest piece of this long term planning has to be nil and so we know teams that that have like people who are doing nil work and and sort of managing that but um the, you almost need the equivalent of a salary cap person like okay here's how we can budget out the next couple of years uh we've when bill was on he talked about uh bill conley was on last week he talked about you know when teams decide to all right we've got a really strong year this year like our offensive line is all upperclassmen and we think we can go so this is the year to go all in so we're gonna we're gonna dip into next year's budget almost to 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 get the best players in this year because this is our year um to have that sort of long-range planning but also to know a little bit about you know a lot of the the analytics work in the nfl has resulted in reforming the thinking of positional value of where the, the difference makers truly are and i think that requires i mean that that, that that's going to require some pretty decent study and expertise but it seems like that's a skill set that nobody has in large part because the thing is too new no one started asking the questions like that's that's the bigger bit, right? Like you could probably build a, a content marketing thing for college football just around saying, all right, these are the actual important questions that you need to start answering. And these are, you know, little pieces of research that we've been able to do. You know, I think Sumer have done a lot of that, but their focus is still on the NFL. College football actually, I think, is a bigger market and, and one that's more ripe for disruption. Um, not least because money only takes you so far. Like game execution takes you a lot of the way as well. Uh, finding one or two weapons that can break things up is and there's also luck involved too so I, i'm gonna i want to cast forward because it has an overlap into what we'll discuss more about the draft but sometimes repetition is useful as well so i was kind of chewing on this this problem of what is the right way to go about building thing and i've built a couple of different departments and companies as to find the first principles what is the most important nil is and and in every sport the roster or the personnel or the squad is the most important thing, right? Like coaches can't win games by themselves. The players actually win the games. Coaches can help out. So the first step is always, how do we find ways to better evaluate talent, right? And then can we find the ones that fit our budget is the second sort of bullet on top of that. The one that we talked about just a minute ago, which goes across both different sports is what is the timeline and incentives for doing that? because that will make different choices based off of it. And it's not always just about, oh, I'm worried about my job this year. It's like, do we have a window? Sometimes these are legit. Like you, you, you might have a franchise star or a pair of stars that have X years remaining on their contract. And so because of that, we're gonna fit them into this box and we've actually got surplus contract that we can spend because you know, in, in the quarterback case, they're on the rookie. And so we were able to, to you know, dial in some weapons over the next two years that we might have to worry about in the future, but we're gonna go for it now. Then the next question is, can we prolong that window? What decisions can we make to prolong that window? Don't can we develop- James Wiseman. Oh, sorry, different sport. <laughs> <laughs> can we develop players? That's a, almost a different question in its own way, right? So, so when we're looking at, are we going after a thing with the window right now? Or if we're not doing that, can we develop players and have them that are a little more project based? This is very much the the hinky style and you know trust the process. Like if you have enough swings of the bat and you try and get high profile projects and you have time to develop those projects, then you you're in, in good shape there. And then the last bit, which is a little bit about the that Alex Lewis Peach is um, can we accumulate draft or NIL resources and have more swings of the bat? And that kind of feels a little college. Uh, developed as well, where if you've got a good recruiting department from the high school space, 
you know, can you bring them in? Can you show them that they're developing? Can you talk them through the guidelines? Can you have coaches around and support people around that show them this is your path? We're going to get you there. Just give us a little bit of time. Uh, but it comes all the way back around to the biggest edge for any team in any single sport is to be aware of the edges and then execute those to the best of your ability over and over again. And your cycles will go, hey, we've got a great squad. We've got a senior quarterback. We've got, a, you know, we've got an offensive line that's going to protect him. Let's go now. But then the next year, you don't have that. And so what do you do in the next year? And so you actually need to, to ride those things. But the most important bit there is, can we build the best information? And then can we execute that over and over and over again? And I think that is the area where college is just a, a fucking wasteland. Like it's barren right now. And maybe it stays that way for a while. Because as we just said, we looked around. And we don't see a lot of people that are doing sort of public research or that are obviously qualified to do that. I, I'm sure that, that it's the same for you too as for me. You get a lot of sort of students, recent graduates reaching out and saying, hey, how do I, you know, I, I'm very interested in working in sport X what the, or in sports, like what kind of projects should I be looking at to sort of prove myself? And, you know, I think that there's a history of people who have done good public work doing like, uh, salary cap roster management kind of tools um, in, in I'm thinking specifically in basketball, which I'm more familiar with. A lot of people have, have, have parlayed that into jobs with teams, with agencies, what have you. And obviously there's an informational problem here that we don't, you know, we don't see the NIL contracts. Um, there aren't always contracts, which is, which is a whole other um, kettle of fish. I think I, I would say that that's like attacking that and building something public that way, I think that that's, you, you do that successfully. I think you're going to get hired <laughs> by, by some universities. Like that's a skill set we need. Nobody else has, has shown the ability to do it. Um, so I think I want to get to Matt's a, point in just a second as well, because I know you yeah. had one, but even just building the menu of edges, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's a hireable thing right there. And, yeah. and one thing you find in this, in the sports space, especially, and even in sort of the startup space is if you have young people that just come in and execute and try to solve problems, even if you haven't been hired yet, but you're just like, Hey, give me a problem that you've been thinking about lately that you think somebody you know should, should tackle. If you have the drive to be able to do that, and I'm not trying to get people to do free work. In fact, we don't actually ever have free interns here, but I, there are times when you really want a job, you want to work in a place. And you're like, how do I get somebody's attention? Like stay in their inbox, show that you're productive, show that you're very thoughtful and willing to do that. Sometimes it doesn't have to be an inbox, sometimes it's public work, but that is the way that people do get hired for these jobs all the time. Matt, let's get out of your way and go ahead and make your points, bud. No, I was saying the NIL and, you know, I think it's easy to obviously make the look at the NFL salary cap and what teams are gonna do, but, you know, it's a little bit more like baseball or other sports that don't have a salary cap you know where you get teams like the yankees who are just going to spend and spend year over year you know ohio state this year i just saw an article that came out that their roster and coaching staff cost 34 million dollars this year and that is probably five years worth of salaries at a lot of places and so not every team is competing on the same level. You know, we talked about it, I think last week at some point, the NFL is set on parity, right? Draft modeling and salary cap and how they structure this uh, schedule and everything like that. There are sports that are very much not like that. And if you are not going to find an edge being able to spend more than other teams, you're going to have to find an edge in other ways. And a lot of it, you know, comes down to what can you do on the field and whether it's finding players who are undervalued or using unique um, schemes that are going to be difficult to prepare for and give you a better opportunity to deploy the talent that you have. You know, teams that don't have all of that money are going to have to figure out ways to compete. Even if you do go to the Super League of college football, there are still going to be haves and have nots. and the, the ability and the chance for teams to innovate and use data to a higher degree is going to help them. And, and I think that's where well, all the time it's like, what can we do to help these teams? And that's really where we sit when we're trying to help these guys. So there, there's actually, there's a, there's a, a team that we have, we have talked to that has actually made what I think is, is almost like the perfect 
higher in that regard. And that's Duke. Um, the gentleman who's who, who's handling a lot of their NIL stuff is a friend of mine named uh, Benuk uh, Kondidawaku. And his background is he was he's Australian. He's a he's a grad student at at Duke. Now he went back to school. He used to be the assistant general manager of an Aust Australian rules football team. And you, you're talking about all the differences it, it, between, you know, what would like the, the this everyone has the same cap and everything like that. I have been talking to him about this. Like it's there's both sort of the regional aspect that is similar to a lot of college recruiting in that the, your ability to access the pool of players in your local area is much greater. And also every team has a different salary cap number and you don't really know what everyone else's cap number is. And that's sort of the environment you're operating in under in this space at, at present, as there's not like, you know, there aren't these, these public resources of, you know, a Alabama does not have a cap sheet out there. Yes. I, Maybe I, we'll was see laughing, I was talking to a couple of NBA GMs um, uh, around Sloan's time, and <laughs> they were talking about just the differences between sports and like, you don't know what the contract language is for all of these different things. Just like, no, we never see them ever. The only way you get them is if the agent gives you a legit copy of it, which good luck with that as well. You only know your own players and what it looks like. And they're like, oh, that probably makes it a lot harder. It's like, yes, there, there's a cloud of war <laughs> or fog of war that you you do not know. I, I was off uh, mic when, when you said, Australian rules football, but Bill Connolly and I think that that may still be the greatest of sports. It's a platypus of a fucking sport, but it is wonderful to watch. I've been to an Aussie rules football game in Australia, and it, it's amazing. Yes, so it's, good, it's great. Uh, and I'm I'm sad that they've gone away from the uh, curious George's friend, except wearing white. Uh, you know, the man in the yellow hat, but it's white, you, you know, the, 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 that's, that's what the referees used to, used to wear with the, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the pointing for the goals. Um, you know, obviously I watched a lot of like 2 a.m. ESPN when I was growing up to, to know these things about, <laughs> that's my main experience. Um, I wanted to, to come back to something that, that, uh, Ted, I think you brought up which is like development plan. Um, that, that, that made me think of, um, you know, a book I've recommended a ton in the player development air area is the MVP machine, which um, among other, it, it features, you know, friend of the program, Kyle body in, 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 in driveline baseball. But one of the interesting things that, that I really picked up from there is I believe it was the Astros when they would acquire a pitcher, they would bring the, the relevant people into the room, sit down. Here's, here's what we're going to do to make you better. And that seems like a very powerful model for, Re recruiting and retention, I would think, to just know what's the plan. And I, I think that that's super important. I think that in baseball, it's probably more available now. But when they were doing it, it was like unheard of uh, that somebody externally has a plan. A lot of times nowadays, like professional athletes have lots of people with plans. They've got their own plan. They've got like the team plan and like how much do you fight about that? And, and what's lots, lots and lots. I, I, we know that. Yeah. There was a there was a player, uh, there was a player that used to play for Seattle, and uh, he was a very good player. He also previously, I believe, played for Newcastle United. Uh, and after training, when the people that thought that they had sort of maximized his productivity for the Seattle Sounders, um, he would then go have an additional workout with his trainer, and and they're like please don't do that. Like your, your fitness is very important. We are aware that you, know, <laughs> you might have external things, but we don't know exactly what they are. And it, we're just trying to keep you optimally fit for what is quite a long season. And, and they never got to the point that he stopped doing that. He's a great guy. Like, and, and he did have a, a good career. Uh, the NBA, I suspect is probably similarly difficult and you're managing these giant, almost alien like athletes on planes and, uh, in in automobiles and late nights and in hotels and whatever, and then you're like, all right, how do we keep them optimally fit, and how do we make sure that you know we're meeting with the league's new regulations about keeping them optimally fit and making them available for games and stuff like that? It's an impossible problem, but it's also one that for college athletes in particular, like you should be able to have almost a from day one, if you say that you're actually going to go after this player, this is what the dossier on this player looks like. And these are the things we want you to work on. And these are the ways that we're going to get you there. And this is the strength and training program, but this is also the stuff that we see in your tape that you know could be better, or we see in your, your data that could be better. 
Um, and this is the video behind it too. Uh, like that's, if you really care about getting a player that might be life changing, it might not. Um, but can you do that for 10,000 players a year? No. <laughs> can, can you do that for 500? That's a big department. My my suspicion is that that would have a a positive screening effect in that if you bring a player in and he's like, no, oh, I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. Like, great. This isn't the school for you. You may be four stars, but I think you're one of the four stars who's less likely to make it because, you know, we can talk about like growth mindset or whatever. Um, but I think that, it, but if you have someone who is, you know, about the work that way, I think that's a, generally speaking, I think that's probably a positive indicator. Yeah, Matty had to step out, but you know, that, that first year grind as a, as a high school kid that's going into a program, like that's real. And it's real in every single thing that you do in life. And when somebody hires you, you're probably six months away from being vaguely productive, depending on what the job is. And that first six months is just how do I upskill myself and how is the organization upskilling me as fast as humanly possible? And in most organizations, they are bad at it, <laughs> probably because everybody else that's supposed to be involved in it does not have time to upskill you. And so a lot of it comes back to you. Here, you probably get some help but it's helped spread across a hundred individuals and the best of them are getting more of the help. And so how do you make sure that you are front and center as somebody who has the potential and the future output to, to invest in that? Like that's a big deal. Um, but also you need to prove that you are that type of player. And, and a lot of kids probably won't see that because when they come out of high school, they're a big fish in in whatever pond that they come from and so they've been treated like oh yeah you're going to be great you're going to be awesome you're this you're that and if you don't have the the work like the the mindset of kobe or michael or this or that like there is an element of that that means that you're just going to fail because as much talent as you have like you're not going to overcome everybody else that has similar amounts of talent putting in the time and the energy and the focus and the learning to do so it's the the steepness of that curve and sort of the right tail of the talent distribution i don't think is 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 that well understood unless you're There's, real tall yeah in which case you, there are a few of you yeah <laughs> yeah um but but even then like yeah if you're you know if you're if you're seven if you're a seven foot tall american male that's 25 years old you have sort of a a baseline five percent chance of being in the nba regardless now there's a difference between being in the nba and oh i'm i'm signing 200 million dollar contracts yeah like, what's the league minimum yeah uh, league minimums uh, depending on on length of service is like high one low two mm -hmm. um but like no there's a there's a player that was on the box when i was there who openly admitted it's like you know, if I'd have really wanted to, I could have gotten like an Anthony Davis contract, but I'm good making 10 million a year. And I like on one hand, like, okay, it's a respect that like, you know who you are, but on the other hand, ugh, yeah, as a, as a competitor, like the wasted potential on, on the competitiveness. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure he was right, by the way, about that, that he could have ever been that, but that's, that, uh, he's got to tell himself that. Yeah, you exactly. Know, sleep at night. Let's finish up by by like getting your crystal ball out and like how do you see this developing in in the college space? Is it going to be like the roving band of the roving merry band that follows coach from place to place? Is that going to expand to have all these sort of further from the field longitudinal roles, or is that going to be taken over a, a, a function of of universities? My wager on this is that because it'll be more comfortable, coaches will come with someone to run their program effectively. Like they'll have the chief of staff role, which is not the same as the GM role. Um, and that chief of staff role may only be focused on certain areas, whereas the, you know, the coaches bit will be slightly different. But I think that that will be what is most likely to happen. You'll have sort of a, a pairing, a little bit like San Francisco, where you've got sort of Lynch and Shanahan that get along really well and allegedly have like, you know, tons of family time together. Um, that might be the way of it uh, because it's more comfortable for the current coach's mindset. Now, is that the right way? Probably not, <laughs> but, but uh, it is the way that I think is more likely to be adopted. The next big question then is like, who is going to do this fastest that understands the problems? And I think that's a job for, for a lot of people and, and also people that have been in and around sport that might want to be able to organize something at this level. You're running a company, 
effectively is what you're doing. And that's a big, big job and a big ask. You have to have the maturity to do it. You have to speak all these different languages. You have to have good relationship skills because you're dealing with all these different people. But then you also have to have like organizational skills around hiring and the NIL and the people and the players. Um, I don't think it's a, a near term thing. I think it's like five to 10 years, but first mover advantage is massive. It's been the same in every sport. And particularly with the way college football looks like it's going, people keep floating these ideas where, you know, Super League and other and, and whatever, like that is mandatory to compete at the, the top levels there. And disruptive strategies around this stuff have long legacies, long, long legacies. So if you're early on it, you will reap the benefits for a long time. Uh, to, to bring it full circle a little bit to the Alec Lewis argument, I think it's knowing how to do it and then executing it are so different so different like i think that the like you lay the plan the plan out on paper it's not super complicated it's just it, it's it's a it's it's sort of like you know uh culture isn't something you have it's something you do it's an everyday kind of thing to operate in a certain way um, i also think that the literally the term chief of staff is actually a pretty apt description for what this role is going to be your job is going to be politics like 80 percent of the time uh, you know, and and that that's reflective of of those of us who used to love watching political shows on on television. Like the chief of staff is a tough bird or bastard. <laughs> Leo McGarry would have been a hell of a secondary coach, but uh, yeah, um, he's about, about that size too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like you know he played it played in the '60s, and he he uh, he played next to next to Night Train Lane in the '60s, and really, uh, if you re reread Paper Lion, he uh, he shows his, up in there. His smoking habit never actually you know <laughs> contributed to anything other than uh, good nights out. Um, on that note, since we've we've plumbed multiple like oh my god we're old references, I think that's a pretty good spot to end. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I think we're going to really focus on the draft next week because uh, uh, I don't know if you know this, the NFL draft is next weekend. So uh, for, for Matt, who had to hop off a little early, uh, Ted, you got anything else you want to uh, close with? No, it's it's nice to be back, invited back as, a, mm -hmm. as an occasional guest. Maybe I'll just be like Andy Richter at some point and just show up and talk the entire time. I mean, you know, the, the, you, you are the boss. So We, we tried to get him off the couch, but he yeah. wouldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> all right for for matt and ted uh, i'm seth part now this has been the stats bomb football podcast take care and talk to you again next week